Zulu says, Angas Yakezana, each hand washes the other. If you have got one, one hand, you don't know how to wash it. So if the environment looks after us, we should do the same, look after the environment so that it can continuously be able to look after us. Uh, Sine Fubu is a dynamic, uh, inspiring and deeply committed educator, a social and environmental activist and a professional environmental manager. He was born on the Pondo land while host a place of deep significance in his life. He is deeply committed to the struggle for the protection of the Kobeleni Jones on the Wild Coast against Australian Titanium Mining Company. He is against imposed development while favoring bottom-up, locally induced human skills development that will benefit local people. He is a champion for the rights of rural communities affected by extractive industries. He has begun his 13th year of geography teaching with his last eight years at Kesney College at Waters Hill. He has two academic degrees, a BA Ed in Geography and Education, a Master of Philosophy in Environmental Management, which he did through Stellenbosch. And he has appeared on many television shows, including Showline, Cut Blanche, 5050, and a series of other films on YouTube advocating against environmental degradation. Uh, Sidembuku believes that cultural ecotourism is an essential tool to boost job creation within rural communities as it performs an important role of passing down value, valuable indigenous knowledge to the younger generation who would otherwise lose their connection with their rich tradition. Uh, Mr. Sidembuku has authored more than 10 books of which the latest is the medicinal and charm plants of Pondolet. He was nominated as one of the top seven 2015 South African Conservationists of the Year. He was a finalist in Ecological Award in Eco Warrior category. He has negotiation experience with indigenous communication of Basutu, Amathubi, and Amabata, and Amambondo on the implementation of conservation agreement in Alfred Dunzo District Municipality of the Eastern Cape Province of South Africa. The Kulubeni case which I'm going to be talking on is uh, uh, more than 15 years of work, so and it would be impossible to kind of to give you everything and anything. The people, I cannot do justice in terms of representing the voices and the aspirations of the world people, but I will do my level best to kind of to open your eyes in terms of what has been happening along the Pondolet Wild Coast. I've coined it Protecting Ecological Infrastructure for the Realization of Systematic Development. In my talk, I would like to kind of take the struggle against mining as a struggle to protect the land or the ecological infrastructure, um, which is yielding services for people who are dependent on the, on the environment. So as I go through, just understand, I'm, trying, I'm trying to take an ordinary people struggle on the ground. I'm going to start from a global level, what's happening, come down to national level, and then, and then, and then dive down to the struggle at Kolobini. Okay. Um, if, for instance, we were to look uh, globally, we have your, your SDGs, where the world leaders have come together and, and come up with those 17 sustainable goals, which is what every nation in the world is supposed to aspire to and strive to achieve. A universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. And this second one, very relevant again to what the Colombian people are demanding from, from government and from everyone in terms of the strike that I'll be talking to you about. It's, it's, it's about ending poverty because when they look at the proposed mining, it will take them from uh, a very a good base of livelihood to a poverty one. And they, and they are protecting their land, so protecting the planet, thinking globally but acting locally, and ensure that people enjoy peace and prosperity. Mining has done away with the social fabric within that community. So using this, which is at a global scale, but looking at what this community is doing to fulfill this is something which is very significant. These unite us together to make positive change for both people and, and the planet. 
Again, okay? poverty eradication is at the heart of the training. So then you will see how the people, the ordinary people on the ground, perceive poverty versus the imposed um, development. Okay, and then um, if we were to look into the sustainable development, one is to end poverty, no hunger. No? And then if you're looking at that one to end poverty, people must have access to land in order to end poverty. So therefore protecting your land is very critical. Zero hunger, you must be able to produce food or you must have money to buy food. And then, so therefore, zero hunger for rural people means again having land to produce food, good health, and well-being means having good um, diet in terms of your food production. And then um, looking at the gender equality, clean water, um, all of these ones where I put the hearts, they speak directly to having land security. So for rural people, they need to have land, and not just land, but productive land. Um, and then if we were to move on to innovation reduce, in inequality again, you cannot achieve that if people, rural people, do not have access to land. Sustainable uh, cities and communities, you cannot have a sustainable community if the community is not able to produce its own food. And then responsible consumption and production, if people are able to, again, to consume the food they put in rural areas, they need to have access to land. And then, um, Climate action, for them to be able to build resilience to climate change and uh, to be able to be less vulnerable, they need to have uh, access to good quality productive land. And also, life below water, they need to look after their rivers, they need to look after their groundwater. All of these things, if the mining goes ahead to Kolobeni, it will impact directly in terms of these um, um, life on land. For instance, if you were to look at the conditions in number 14, the conditions which were set up by the Department of Environmental Affairs that must be fulfilled by the mining company with regard to water, it becomes impossible to mine in that area because they're very sensitive environment, there isn't in, in, in enough water. Mining companies say no, they can, once the water is finished, they will uh, resort to sea water. Peace, justice, and strong institution again to achieve that rural people must have access to the productive land. In terms of partnerships, again, partnerships as a rural people, partnering with other institutions, other organizations, and all that becomes very, very critical if these people are to sustain their, their lives in many ways. Moving on, looking now quickly at national level, what's happening at national level? Again, I'm looking at what is relevant to the people who are fighting to protect their land. South Africa Central Policies is one of the, we know that in South Africa we've got an amazing biodiversity. We are amongst the top three countries globally in terms of what we have if we were to look at natural capital. Natural capital being what we have in the environment in terms of biodiversity. We are um, the third most biodiverse country. 10% of the world's total known breeds, fish and plant species occur in our country. The diversity, rarity, endemism, and other unique aspects is what sets South Africa's products apart from this. And the countries recognized by UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, um, World Conservation Monitoring Center, as, the, uh, as amongst the 18 other mega diverse countries. So we are a very important country when it comes to biodiversity at a global scale. And also, in terms of, of mineral wealth, of course, the reality is that. We are a country that has been built from mining. Uh, the country's mineral wealth is amongst the top five in terms of coal production, consumption, and exports. Talking of coal in the face of climate change. South Africa's mineral reserves represent 88% of the world's known reserve of platinum metals, um, manganese, 73% of chromium, 45% of vanadium, and 41% um, of, of coal. Um, the Chamber of Mines South Africa also reports that during 2009, the mining industry contributed 8.8% to the country's GDP and created direct employment for 491, that's almost half a million people. So in other words, mining is important, and this country was built from mining. But it doesn't mean 
we should mind every piece of this country. So we need to be careful. Remember this operation in Pakistan now, where we must put out, we have given enough sites for mining of the land, we must move into the oceans. Should we, have we done enough research to inform what, what must happen into our oceans is a, is a question. Exploitation of resources benefits the population of the country and in some cases outside the investors. In terms of monetary gains for consumable at, at the end and the creation of wealth. So also, bearing in mind, we know that when we exploit those resources, we benefit both internally and externally. For instance, the reserve, the titanium or half mineral reserve in the economy is worth about 12 billion and, and about 8 billion will go to Australia to the mining company and only only about um, the other one who should come into the country in any form of tax. However, at the same time, extracting value from natural systems for, for lifestyle gains without paying attention to sustainability can do irreparable harm to the very systems that are required for human well-being. And that's where the economic struggle speaks to. Is it the most sustainable way to bring about development to that community? Part of the solution may be found in the rise of the green economy. Again, in South Africa, we have a national policy on green economy. Um, green economy is a more sustainable form of, of economy, not be as productive as, um, as the other forms of, of economy. Effectiveness and uh, successful protection and management actions must, however. So if you're looking at the green economy, I'm, again, I'm bringing the green economy policy here in order again to look at the struggle and the relevance to to also to in terms of other national policies like the green the green paper. If you're looking at the green one, a system of economic activities that is currently largely um, focused on cleaner energy that improves human being without compromising the natural system. Effective and successful protection and management actions must however understand the links between the components of natural system and human activities. We need to be able, the natural system being your, your natural capital, as well as where finite limits to exploitation may lie. Such understanding is crucial to ensure that utilization of resources does not exceed their natural rate of regeneration or the minimum level required for ecological function. Or that. So in other words, again, we can place the struggle to protect land the national environmental concerns um, in, in, include current proposed mining, especially the proposed hydraulic fracturing. We know that in South Africa, if we were looking at the national concerns in terms of currently the people who are protecting at national level without looking at Colombia, but we know that the Karoo Basin, where for instance they want to do um, hydraulic fracturing, is one in uh, also the whole of the and Midlands. Um, that means as far as Ishoe, stretching all the way to the bottom of the Trans Peak, all the way through to Matatien on the Eastern Cape, the whole that is targeted. And when you look at the number of, the percentage of our population which is located on the coastal stretches, if you allow hydraulic action to happen there, and therefore those are the headwaters are the sources of water, as we know that the, our, our coast, our east coast, the water is mainly coming from the, the bird, the dragon spray. So therefore, if we allow the hydraulic action there, one of the things that we as environmentalists are raising red flags about is polluting the water sources. Um, as well as coal mining in the Krismi and, and, and Mapungwe areas. Again, we know that there's been an outcry in terms of the Krismi within the Malanga um, area along the road to Mbabane, is it um, N4, N7, I think it's N17. In, in terms of that area, again, is the water source. You know that even the municipalities such, such as Umsugali Gua, which means the origin of the VAR, they are within that particular area. So the whole crisis mere area, which has recently been uh, declared a protected environment, fortunately recently by Mpumalanga um, 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 uh, uh, Provincial Department. But despite all that being a protected environment, development of mere resources is 
issue mining licenses on a protected environment, issuing licenses for people to go and mine, and mine coal. Coal in the face of climate change. When is a country we have signed international agreements to cut down on coal to reduce the emission in the face of climate change? In country, as it mentor age, you know this, you are living here in Kauten, so you should know enough about the acid mine drainage. And now let's look at national level, what is being said again in terms of, we know that our constitution, so constitution recognizes everyone has a right to an environment that is not harmful to their health, well-being, right to have an environment protected. In other words, the struggle of complaint for people saying no to mining on their land. So it is within the, the, the premises of this. And when you remember that again in April, there was a, a, a high court in North Houghton High Court here in Victoria on the 23rd and the 24th of April this year, where the Colombian community came to this court to demand the right to say no to mining on their land. So again, so this, looking at the constitutional right and also the right that says globally all the countries, minerals are said to belong to the state, and sometimes to get to the mineral, the state doesn't have to go underground like they are doing in Jobek. They have to, the Colombian minerals are not underground minerals, but they need to, to interfere with the surface and the surface rights, and the rights that belong to the people. So it's a very complicated matter when you want the land protected for your own rights, for your right to a health and safe environment. Um, and which is not harmful to your life. And the state rights to access the minerals, because minerals belong to the state. It's a, it's a, it's a global thing, it's not just a sort of thing, but it's a very interesting. We went to court in April, and the judge is here to make the decision um, as to whether we have the right to say no to the proposed mining. It's a very difficult decision because there's no precedent and they have to, but we know it's a constitutional matter again, so it will have to end up at the, um, at the Congo. Okay, so if we're looking at the state of the environment, in South Africa every five years, the Department of Environmental Affairs um, writes a report, which is the state of the, env of the environment report, which, is, which tells us what is happening to our environment. And every time this report is published, it shows a declining state of our environment due to all the economic activities and all the development which we are, we, are, we, are, we are doing. Let's look at some of the state of the environment report. is designed to communicate credible, timely, and acceptable information about the condition of the environment to decision makers so that we can, as decision makers, especially to the development workers, be able to have a reference with me. Balancing environmental protection with economic development and with it, the betterment of the lives of our people remains at the core of all South African government policies. That's the Minister of Environmental Affairs. That's a, a typical political statement. <laughs> As a typical, typical political statement, which is something very common, you hear it more often, to say we must uh, striking the balance. Yes, we need to strike the balance. And um, striking the balance, it means we have to be able to, to identify. You remember a few years ago, there was one document which was put up by CMP and, and, um, and the DMR, which is called the no-go areas for mining. And the document is not very useful. Don't ask me why. But, but you see, that my belief, I know I might be wrong, is that if I'm an environmentalist, I must spend my time and my life fighting to protect the environment. Mm -hmm. And somebody who, is, who, is, um, who works for the minerals department has got to spend his or her time fighting to mine the minerals. Okay? That's a fair game. But I'm not very convinced when environment minister starts making a political statement. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, when you are responsible, if you are responsible for that department, you have to spend your life to defend the environment. Often, as an environmentalist, I have to 
I have to challenge the minister. And it's not supposed to be like that. I'm supposed to support the minister. I took the minister to court on uh, the highway, cutting through Pondoland, di dissecting the Pondoland Center of Enemies. So the Department of Environmental Affairs has got the responsibility of protecting the heritage of this country. Yes, Mira's department has got. So when I fight against the injustices on the environment, I expect the Environment Department to be my partner. I'm not supposed to be fighting against the Environment Department. But in this country, I have to. I have to because of politics. Because as a politician, she has got to stand in that and reach a political consensus. It's a very difficult position. I wouldn't like to be the Environment Minister. Yeah. <laughs> because I understand it's a very difficult job. And you have to say statements like that Things that we don't mean because you've got to be politically correct. Yeah. It's not an easy job at all. So, so, um, so we have to sometimes sympathize with the minister. Um, okay, the second environmental uh, outlook, the, um, they said that these things, the food and water energy makes us potential areas of conflict with regard to food, water, and energy makes us potential areas of conflict with regard to the provision of these services. There is a conflict because other economic activities, like such as mining, they interfere with that food, water, energy nexus. So in that particular area. So renewable energy and changing, I'm not going to worry about the green economy. Advancing green economy will mean reducing economic activities with unsustainable environmental impacts. And for me, mining, therefore, is in there. And adopting more sustainable activities that have job creation and poverty alleviation benefits. And for me, the Colombian people are speaking to that. They are more sustainable, and they are making sure that. Ecological infrastructure. This refers to natural functioning ecosystems delivering valuable services, such as water, climate regulation, soil formation, disaster risk reduction when we protect our wetlands. Greater investment in ecological infrastructure has significant socio-economic development benefits. If we don't protect our ecological infrastructure, the natural infrastructure which delivers services to us, we may kiss the so-called development of Dubai. So we have to, as a country, we need to. That's why SEMPI was able to push uh, amongst those SIPs, you know those SIPs. Mm -hmm. So SEMPI was able to push in SIP 19, which is about ecological infrastructure. That's fantastic. But we've got to make sure that we are all singing in, in the same uh, song sheet when it comes to protecting ecological infrastructure. So it's a very critical component, protecting the land. So the struggle of must be seen through these relevant lenses. Um, our National Environmental Management Act, with regard to regulatory matters, a comprehensive environmental regulatory regime centered on environmental impact assessments, environmental management permits, and compliance and enforcement has been established and is fully operational. That's an environmental statement. I like that statement from the minister. But then it begs one thing, enforcing and making sure that the the vet is being applied. So that's a typical um, statement. So that is what was said in 2016 about NEMA when they were revising the NEMA. NEMA is, um, is, is an act where I think NEMA is what is it? Um, 2008, I think that is suspect there. Um, so, but this was the comment because in uh, 2014, and, and up to 2016, they were revising the NEMA regulations. So this is what the minister um, had to say. So again, again, managing the environment and making sure that things are. If we, look, if we were to look into the ecological infrastructure, again, I'm not going to spend time on this slide, but you can see the linkages in terms of the well-being of the people. Ecosystems alone, without the interference, of people, they are providing so much services to us. That's what we mean by ecological infrastructure, the biodiversity, the landscapes, the mountain, the stream, the forest, everything gives us so much. So therefore protecting the land, the landscapes, the mountains, is ensuring that 
a flow of services is due to the people. So therefore, protecting the land and managing the land and using the land wisely means a lot in terms of the well-being of the people. Now therefore, I've taken you from an international uh, landscape, at the global level, what's happening, and then, and then I've taken you at national level, few things of what is happening, and I'm saying these are the things I'm trying to give you some spectacles in, in, uh, uh, to look at the Kolobeni story. Now I'm going to start telling, and I'm going to tell you the story of Kolobeni more in pictures. And it's a very easy story to tell through pictures because it's a story that I've been part of. So now the first part I'd like to introduce you to Kolobeni so that you know I'm, I'm trying to take you there now. So, so that you can see what Tulobeni is like. Starting from Tendu, this is in Tendu Estuary. This is in Tendu Estuary. And Tendu River enters the ocean about 200 meters from where the photo is taken is the, is the waves. So it's coming from up there. On the other side is Mkambati Nature Reserve. So, and this side is the Tulobeni side. So this is the beginning. So this is the southern boundary of Tulobeni. Another 25 kilometers from here going up, you get to the case of any border. So, so this is all upon the land. So this is the Ntendu Estuary. These are the canoes which are being used by, by, by the people who visit Ntendu every weekend. It's an awesome place because it's my home. Um, so, so home is always beautiful. This is showing you now when you see the vehicles, that's the Ntendu Lodge, and then and then another 200, uh, um, two, two kilometers up is to get to those canoes. So this is now from the top of the hill above, that's the river Muntendu. And then on the other side, that's Umkambati Nature Reserve, um, and the St. June Forest, and that's Mosquito Beach. And then walking along that beach, another three kilometers, then you get to the Stranlopa waterfall and so the very first waterfall that tumbles down onto the ocean. So how many how many do we have globally? We have twelve. We have twelve. And how many do we have in Pondoland? Three. We have three of those waterfalls, but I always argue with him and say, no John, we have close to five in, in Pondoland. It's just that some you see them during the rainy season. Um, okay, um, so this is in Tendu Estuary. And the right at the end of the estuary is where those canoes. And right um, on the left hand side is the lodge, which I showed you earlier on. And um, something very special about this estuary is the fact that it gets visited by kingfish during the hot season from March through to October. And nobody knows. There is a film on that which is narrated. Um, by um, David Attenborough. So, um, so the, the kingfish, they come here, thousands of them. They just come and nobody knows why they come here. Because there are many other beautiful estuaries that are clean, pristine like this one, but they don't go there. They come between March and October. So when you go there, you will find them. And then uh, they just, they, they have a culture of making amazing movement in the Australia, but you have to go there to see them, I mustn't tell you. So, um, this is Sikombe, the next estuary from Ntendu, then you move on to Sikombe. And then um, there's still Ntendu there, this is still Ntendu now, taken from the air, that's the lodge you see looking upstream now. You can see the lodge there, well sheltered. Um, this is also now, if you are in the estuary, you are canoeing up on that estuary, canoeing up. So you get to, this is the first waterfall, there's about three waterfalls that, that, that you see like that. So this is waterfall number one. And the lemonish color trees, those are the mangroves, the black mangroves. You also have few species of the white mangroves um, that are found here. In terms of legal protection, this Tolobeni land has got various legislations that protect that land. Despite mining application, this land is protected. The first one is Decree 9 of 1992, which was passed by, you know, General Bantu Olomisa of UDF. When Olomisa was a military ruler of the homeland of Transkai, 
between 1987, when he, he overthrew Stella Stone, and then all the way through to 93, 94, just before the dawn of the, the, the dawn of democracy. So Bando Lumisa, who is in politics, now so was the military ruler, who was a general, who was uh, ruling Transcar. Very effective, it was very, very good. <laughs> in terms of what we got down, I can, I can admit that. He, he did an amazing thing. I'm not here to talk about the Lomisa's Transcar. But amongst other things, very special things that he did was to pass a decree. You know, all the military rulers, even the kings and the queens, um, they rule by, by a decree. So you just sign into law. You don't have to consult anyone. You just sign, make a decree to say, so he made a decree to say the whole of the Transkei coastline, the one kilometer from the high water mark inland, is a conservation area. Fantastic. Fantastic. Remember, he was the, also the first deputy minister of environmental affairs, deputy yeah. to Vali Musa. That's when they came up with the, um, where they pointed the driving of uh, vehicles on the beach in South Africa that came out from there. You can actually see that the, the, the general has got some green eyes and green mind. So he came out with that, with that decree. <laughs> that 1992 decree protects the entire coastline of Transcar. So we only had a bill, which is the Integrated Coastal Management Act, um, the ICMA, with, which came in recently, recently, um, must have been like five years or six years ago. It's a very new, that one, the ICMA. ICMA is Integrated Coastal Management Act, which is the act which now protects the entire coastline of South Africa. So therefore the whole, the whole country has learned from the general there in terms of the 1992 decree. Though the ICMA has already been enacted, it's up and running, but Decree 9 is still very active in the Eastern Cape on what used to be transcribed. And it's and this a very important, because there are sections of it. If you ask me why those sections of Decree 9 were not included in the ICMA, I don't know, because they should have in included them in this new act. But so that decree is still being used very much by the green scorpions in the Eastern Cape to protect the, the coastline. So it is still very active. And the certain sections of it which have not been replaced so it was not repealed when ICMA was, was passed. So, so ICMA again is protecting one kilometer. But the interesting thing about both of those acts is that though you are protecting the one kilometer of the coastal land, but when you get onto an estuary like the Ntendu one, so if it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an estuary where the water comes into during the, 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 the spring tide or the high tide. Therefore, again, your one kilometer will start at the end of the salty water. So in those estuaries, so the one kilometer, and again, you have got the one kilometer, if this is the estuary, you've got also one kilometer from the estuary inland. So, so it actually, so and I'm tell you as a result, it's a protected ma 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 marine env environment. Then the third act is the Marine Living Resources Act, which is the same act that carries your marine protected areas, your MPAs. So we have in our coastline, we have what we call the Ponderland Marine Protected Area, like a nature reserve in the ocean. The entire 22 kilometers that Department of Mayor Resources wants to see mined. It's an MPA, it's a protected area in terms of how do you mine adjacent to a marine protected area? And fortunately, we have had the ORI, Oceanic Research Institute, they have been monitoring for 10 years the effectiveness of the MPA in Ponderland. And they've, come, and they've found amazing results through the enforcement of that. So the number of fish and species and all that. So it is. So those acts are relevant. The land which Mineral Resources Department wants to give a license to be mined, they have issued license. 
and we had to oppose it. So they would, they would uh, withdraw those licenses, they, have, they would issue them, would oppose, and then they would draw them, because when they are getting exposed in terms of what went wrong within that particular process. But I'm trying to say to you, that coastal land we're talking about that they want to mine is a protected area in terms of those. Those are the common legislations that protect that. Again, showing you this is the waterfall of a small stream that joins Unyameni. I'm now taking you to Unyameni, the, the third biggest river along that end, uh, coastline. So when is the rainy season? So you you would see this. Um, this is Unyameni River waterfall. Uh, which is very close, within 300 meters of the, the last waterfall. So you get to the main one of the main stream. Miami, this is Miami waterfall taken from the bottom. This is the plunge pool, so looking up. Um, so also, Tolobeni has got these uh, red sands. These red sands, Actually, they use them as a motivation why they, this area must be mined. They say, no, because the area is degraded and um, it's not vegetation cover. We're doing you a favor. We come and mine this thing and then we'll rehabilitate it and then it will look nice and green. Yeah. What an excuse. <laughs> and we found that these red sands, when you look closely, you find a whole lot of Stone Age tools. So they, so they were, this area was inhabited, if you know your geology, you would know that the big ones are hand axes, and then you have got your small ones, there are no arrowheads here, you have got scrapers, um, you have got all sorts of stone age tools. In those, you can see that stones have been shipped, you can see all the angles to show the, the stone shipping. So, uh, even amazing one, because the other one is the quartz, that one, that one, that, that's, that's a cult, that one. So you find all these amazing Stone Age tools. And these, they date back to early, middle, and the late Stone Age tool. And this, this area was um, inhabited during the Stone Age tool in the same time as the Mapungubwe, which is the Limpopo Valley. The Mapungubwe site, remember where they, they, they discovered that um, gold, uh, golden rhino. So Mapungubwe site and the wild coast were the only two areas that were habitable at one point back in history. These, they date back to 300 to 500,000 years ago. And at that time, due to climate change, the interior of the country was not habitable, and it was only Mapungube Valley and the Wild Coast. And according to the geologist at Vates, uh, Dr. Kathy Kuman, uh, she says, these belong to the Sangwen Stone Age. So the Unone and Western Age tools. Um, so that shows you the tools from another angle. So you find these tools in this, um, if you're looking at this sort of pebble collection, when the sand has been blown away. So the, the mine, when they were prospecting, the mining company, they found that there's a very high concentration of the mineral they want to mine here. I know people are always interested, what mineral? It is heavy minerals. It is uh, your, your collection of minerals, uh, the, the most common one that you know is titania. Yeah. But uh, there are all sorts of other minerals, such as your ilmenite, your butimite, all sorts of things. But it's heavy minerals which are used in the white pigment of paint to make paint white. They're used in laptops, used in calculators, in cell phones, in, um, in aeroplanes, I think the exhaust pipes and all of that. So heavy minerals, they are used in, um, that's what they want to mine. And I think, John, we have what, the 10th largest concentration here. Oh, in, so the, the yeah. mining company claims. Yeah, claims to this to be to be the 10th the, the largest. And the mining companies come from Australia, and Australia has got more concentration than us, but in Australia they passed a law not to mine. <laughs> so they are coming to us. <laughs> Now, I'm taking you to the next river, which is Mpathane. This is Pondoland. This is Tolobin. The, all the land, all the pictures I'm showing you, starting from Tentu, I'm showing you exactly what they want to mine. That's the question that that's, just, that's the point I didn't make to you. All these, if you have seen anything beautiful on what I've been showing you, that's what they want to trash. They want to mine this in the name 
in the name of money, uh, in the name of economic development. That's why they want to trash. So the whole of this, if we were fast forward and have the mining operation, this will all be dust flying around. This isn't Pashana estuary. Um, so they want to mine this. Moving on to the next question. Why do the people, the local community say they want to protect their land, they don't want to see their land being mined? Again, I'm taking you through the pictures to make your life easy so that you can get off, off the hook. People say tourism. This picture is also taken from Bindweni, and I can even, and what you see, the traditional attire you see, that's what the traditional Mbondo attire looks like. You know, some of you, they've never seen, they've never been to Cumberland, and they don't know what we look like in our traditional attire. So that's what it looks like. Those, they are not wearing those things. It is dark, it is part of their head. Mm -hmm. So, and also due to westernization, civilization, and all that external influence, the people still have the traditional way like that, are becoming few, very, very few and scarce. So this was in a kind of a traditional ceremony where the tourists were brought by the guide to come and mingle with the local people. So local people, they say they want tourism. They say they can live with tourism because tourism will not take their land away. It will not fence off their land. It will not degrade their land. So they can live with ecotourism. That's just showing you again how beautiful I can even see one of my neighbors, that lady at the end. Um, and so, shows you how beautiful um, uh, we have. We have different names for Umpigi, Po, Imipi, Jo, Imipo, Lompi, Eba, Mwaz, etc. etc. But, but that's, that's who I am, see? Um, okay, this was, um, this, this was Panyana Camp. When Panyana Camp, Amongst other things, the, the pro-mining lobbyist group, they destroyed this camp um, in order to, because the, the gospel they were preaching is that uh, mining doesn't yield enough jobs, now people must take over. What happens is that the mining company, when they came in, community had already had a, 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 an operating tourism which is called Amatiba Adventures. And uh, John Clark here, my friend, that I've been um, uh, picking his brain in a presentation, went there. So, and then he got to love Pondoland. Then he was hooked forever. So he <laughs> claims to be a, 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 a bondo now like me. And then, so there was this amazing business, community-owned business, won presidential award, award in 2003 as the best and the most successful community-run tourism initiative. Mm -hmm. And when the mining company came, they found the people who were very much united, mm -hmm. saying tourism. It wasn't easy starting the tourism. Okay, okay, I come from a group of the people in Mampondwini, we were very much happy and protect our land. So even trying to, to get this going wasn't an easy at all. And as people, we literally make your life very difficult when you come in with your, your, your proposal from outside. And you have got to prove that it is the best thing to have. So it wasn't easy. And when they, they began to see how this was, was operating, the number of people employed here from the surrounding the surrounding homesteads, how the horses from the community were being hired, for instance, when John went down, they, they had to prepare themselves for riding horses. John and his family, they went towards Lansiria Syria on the, on the west there to learn how to ride a horse, preparing to come back. So, and then they were told that each time you go to learn to ride a horse, take a carrot, carrot stick. And the first thing you do is to give the carrot to your horse to bond with your horse and then you brush the horse before you mount. So when they came down to Pondoland, he brought these carrots for our Pondoland horses. So in order to bond with the horses, and then they came down there to Mzamba River Mouth, is where you meet these horses, and then to ride towards Miamini. So they took out their carrots and gave to their horses. 
horses looked at the carrot and then ignored and started raising the grass. <laughs> um, we, 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 which was a which was a is a very is a very important learning curve because if you take your outside ideas and you they think you can just because because you have studied in the best university, you are educated and you pretend you know it all and you get to a community, you, you want them to listen to you. Hey, you have got to when you get to I'm sure in the learning studies they are telling you this because social sciences and especially sociology does teach people about that. You don't go there and pretend to know it all. You don't go later. Like, like Father Christmas and hope you will deliver. So you go there and listen to the people and hear what people have to say and, all of, and then be able to respond to, to the people. So it was a very hard lesson to swallow for John because the carrots were, they were rejected. But fortunately for him, horses were, did allow them to mount and to be able to enjoy the beauty of honoring. So, the mining company, going back to the, 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 the tourism, the mining company, therefore, when they came in trying to, to work, because the whole of this, what you see, what you see, this is what they want to trash. The whole of this is within the one kilometer. They want to mine up to, up to one and a half kilometer. So they were trying to talk to the people to convince them that actually mining is the way, but people were saying, no, we don't want mining, we're happy with tourism. And then they therefore decided to to co-opt the directors of the of the tourism. They gave them shareholding into the mining company. And then, so they gave them about 5%. They established a company in 2003, which later on, the company is all called Tolbin and Kamen Kamen was given about 25% shareholding. Which therefore, those directors used their power to undermine, to destroy tourism, to squeeze the life out of tourism. Just showing you again some of the festivals we have from Christmas up to Easter. We have those festivals. That shows you how the land is used. That shows you one of the homes in the Tulumeni. You can see the Nsigaba formation, the rock formation, the geology around. This is a sweet potato patch. More than 90,000 goes to one village. That's how productive the land is. The same land they want to mine, by the way. The endemic plants, about 200 endemic plants, which are found only in Tulumeni, not anywhere else. I can show you some endemism, woody plants, large like okay, in streams and river forests. I can just show you, this is one for some uh, Ariosimum tavunensis. It's only found in Ponderland. This is um, Sizigium pondoens, only found there, the Ponderland waterberry along the streams. We call it Amashluka locally. And we also have this palm. This palm is only found in Ponderland, not anywhere else in the world. We call it Gibiosis kafra and the pondered and coconut palm. And it is, is similar to the coconut palm, which you know, but the only difference is that the coconuts are this big. But when you take the coconut and you cut it, it's exactly 100% similar to the coconut you know, which is the big one. Mm. So, and, uh, and these coconut palms, they only grow on the northern bank of two rivers, only two rivers in Pondoland, Mtendu and Msigaba River. The struggle against mining, the interventions, what has been done, partnership with the South Coast, people from Podeto at Market and all that have been supporting the community as well in terms of their march. These are the people we once in July had the march where we were marching to protest against. We didn't go to town to march. We went on a beautiful land on the beach and we organized the Patelier flights and all the cameras to film us protesting against mining. So we're not, didn't have to ask for permission from a municipality. So we went on the beach and we marched on our beautiful land. We had about five planes flying above, filming what's happening, journalists talking to us, and then we got it into the media to give the, the government. This was the picture taken on that day. The picture was taken in 2008 on the 15th of, was it August? Or, August. Yeah, it was August when the minister came Came. You can see the traditional attack again popping up here and there. When the minister came to, to announce the license, but she was met with the protest action, as you can see, Mr. Jamin here, Mashonari too. Um, and, and Zamile, this is the man who's bringing us mining the PE company 
So this is the traditional counselor at Unkulu telling them, no, we do not want. And, uh, and, um, and that banner from South Coast is now part of the archives and communities getting used a lot in terms of this. These are the people protesting on the day the minister, a, an event was supposed to start at 10 in the community to announce this beautiful mining license. It couldn't start up until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. People toy toy and say, we don't want mining on our land. Okay, uh, pack and go MRC. The MRC is the name of the, of the mining company. So the police were there in numbers because they knew. They brought the, the police were saying, we can't arrest these people. They're saying they're putting their land. They're not causing any violence. There's some of the media coverage. The mining company and then asking the minister, what did you say when you say people, they are behind you because they are toying and saying, uh, we must go back home. So it's a very clear link between the proposed end to our coastal road and mining. So when Minister Shikaga became the Minister of Cooperative Governance, tried to bulldoze the whole of thing, thing to, to fast track it, but it couldn't happen. Um, he failed. We have been engaging with the media, we have been enga engaging, John was actually very involved in this project of getting Jack Patel to also to raise the awareness during the concert. Okay, this is showing you how we use the song and dance in protest against mining. And then the land, the degraded land they want, this is Kwanyana River now. And then the lessons learned, traditional leadership is the first target. They will always co-opt. They bribe the traditional leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like they've made our chief a, a director of TM, which is the mining company. They have also made him director of the PE company. They've given him a four by four. There, and we have learned that media is a partner. If you, if you work closely with the media and you inform them, you bring them on board, you keep on updating them, yeah. then media will be able to bring your story up mm -hmm. to, to, to the public. Lawyers have a role to play, we've learned that, but you must manage lawyers because manage all, lawyers only all understand is going to court. So you've got to manage them very, very carefully to an extent that we decided we're not going to have just one legal team, we must have two, so that we can, we can get opposing viewpoints and be able to choose what we think is most suitable to us. But to making sure lawyers don't lead for struggle, we lead for struggle, then the lawyers get in, instructed by us in terms of what to do. NGOs, you must partner with as many. Government does not want to hear people who have learned that. They want people to listen to the government, not the other way around. Lessons learned, documenting the struggle is very important. That is the role that Mr. Clark here has been doing for us. We contracted him as a social worker to come in and document our struggle. Um, so that what we're going to continue to fight. But he has done a fantastic job. John, could you raise up book there? He has uh, written a very thick book. So if you want to hear more about the story, there's a thick book that documents the whole story. Uh, that he has uh, as an outcome of documenting that he has also written. Okay? Have an alternative. That's why we're pushing for mining livelihoods through agriculture. Um, mentoring on history and importance of land. Elders must always mentor the young ones. Let people tell their story in their struggle. That's why I said it will be important for you to watch the films. The films, how you find films, you go to YouTube and you search Tolobeni. There is a whole list of films that, that will come on, on, on your face. So if you go to YouTube, then type Tolobeni, and then the films in Tolobeni will come out. There are many. And all 50 50 program, checkpoint program, cut blanche, and all of those, they are all there. So you will find that we just said Tolobeni. Alternatively, you can look at John has got a blog which is um, called Ito Sindaba. You will be able, otherwise, some of his films they will also they will appear here. He has been fantastic in terms of carrying a camera like he's doing to record everything, every community meeting, in terms of that we have got an amazing archive of close to 50 hours, 50 hours yeah. of films. In closing, I want to say Palasheleni is one of the uh, main characters in our fight. He's one of the, he's late now, one of the senior traditional leaders. And then, because the mining company has pumped in a lot of money using the PE partners, but Palasheleni would say, 
Why pay a low baller for a girl who has not agreed to marry you? So paying the bride price for the girl who hasn't agreed to marry because the community has said no to mining, but they continue to pay low baller every day. I thank you very much. And, and I, would, I, would, I would really think, you know, it would be quite useful to use Toloben in our rural development module as a case study because it really brings in quite interesting things about the contested meanings of, of what development is, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. It actually brings in and injects, you know, you know, us to rethink some of the problems that we have in development, you know, to say what really is development, you know, uh, uh, you know, this struggle about bottoms up, you know, bottom up versus state formations or stuff like that. And again, it, puts, it, it, it also puts the state, you know, uh, uh, into question to say, really, if you say you have a government and a state, to whom should it listen? Does it have its own, you know, ways of seeing development or, you know, should it, you know, respond to the needs that are from, from the ground? And I think this is the biggest challenge of development in our time. Uh, and of course, uh, the state's collusion with the capitalist system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very exciting for me, actually, because uh, it's in my area of work. Sure. So the first question, uh, uh, I just wanted to, to find out if you have um, any baseline information in terms of what happened before, how did people live, as you s rightly said at the beginning, that people are dependent on land in order to sustain their livelihoods. But in terms of, yes, it is possible to dig back to what um, has happened because there's a whole lot of history. And also, for instance, if you're looking at um, the, the John's book, you'll yeah. be able to see the whole lot of the background where, for instance, in the 1950s, 58 to 61, there was what we call the, the, Pondo, the Pondo uprising, which you can find on the internet as well. We have about 23 people who were hanged here in Pretoria, who were buried in Mamelodi, uprising to protect the land in 1958 to 61. Yeah. So there's a whole lot of background history in terms of how people have been harboring, protecting their land. Hence I said we are very notorious as being, we are seen as uh, the inconvenient tribe because we didn't only give a headache to the apartheid uh, government, but also the current government because we are saying no to the imposed development yeah. because we want to protect the land and live a sustainable life. So Secondly, this, uh, this is a very sensitive topic, uh, like in terms of the international um, community. What is the involvement of the Amnesty International? So, yes, we are very much linked to uh, the, 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 the international sphere. Media has been great. Um, in terms of events that has happened, a lot of people have been killed in the fight against mining. And the most significant one was the death of Bazuga. So mm -hmm. Amnesty International, they've been involved, your Action AIDS, your international media and all of that. We have been to many other countries globally to present this, including Australia, England. We've had protest actions taking place in England um, to force the investors to disinvest from Colombia. So we have had um, people bought shares to attend AGMs of the main command in, in, in Australia twice now, where we send people inside to ask their questions. So there's been a lot that has happened that, as I said, I cannot talk. It reminds me of the Rio Tinto issue in the Richards Bay area, which I've read about, and a lot of people that have actually been put in danger and, and as, a, as activists. So. Community in that meeting took a decision that they are going to pop money out of their pockets, hire taxes, low people, go back and meet the people. Yes. Bay. They did that. They went back there. They moved from house to house. How is this mining? How is it treating you? Are you happy with it? They were surprised. People said, people would take water in the basin and wash the wall and said, our walls are like this because of the dust. Mm -hmm. We had painted our houses. They said, look, our buildings, they are cracking. Whenever they're mm -hmm. pushing that um, thing on the pipes underground, it, yeah, it's sort of the, the, the ground moves, our houses, they are falling. When we go to them, they refuse to compensate. Um, and they said, we, we, what we are now sick, we are coughing. And when we go and protest, the mind says we have no proof. They cannot, they say you must go to the chief. When we go to the chief, the chief calls the police, we get arrested. They said, 
We no longer dry our washing outside because of the dust. We have to dry our washing indoors. We hang our washing, our washing lines are inside the house. They said our fruit, we were the, the, we were the fruit basket of KZN. People were buying all the fruits, the avocado pears, the mangoes, the bananas from here. Yeah. But since the mining, the dust started flying, our trees stopped producing. We don't have, we buy fruit from other people. I said, yes, they have built us beautiful schools. They are here, but go inside the schools, they are empty. Because we don't take our kids here to these schools, we take them somewhere else because they get sick if they start here at a young age because of all the, um, the dust which is flying around. Then the people went back and said, not on our land. So therefore my answer is to say no, because they have said they cannot leave. I remember even Umiste Matungu, the, the old man called Gohan, he, he says, even, you can even see the poverty. He says, we had to share our sweet potatoes and madumbes that we had as a, as, a, as a bad cause. He said, we had to share with those people. Those people, they are starving. They cannot produce anything from their land because their land is too. There's always been the cross-examination of theory. Yes. That informs the frame within which everything we are saying is packaged within. I will have a short comment and then a direct question to you. We are dealing with historic problems here, rooted in the discourse of violence, of Voyagas of discovery. The project is still continuing. Uh, Amos Isse calls it civilization of death. The question that I, I, I have is when we shift the geography of reasoning, this thing is not development to be sustained, mm -hmm. but to be completely rejected. Whose development are we sustaining? What is this development project? You can go back to the 1950s. Uh, they, I picked up that word, planned it for us. So the questions of identities and this engagement are very critical. Is it really about the communities or exploiting them for survival of the few? Is this not an underdevelopment, as uh, Walter Rodney would say? Uh, as you have clearly presented here, African people are very spiritual people in a sense that their connection to the land and their rituals connects them to the spirits of their ancestors. They do not look at the land for commercial or consumerist purposes. They have a completely different worldview and interpretation of life. Should we then, if you say, let's do this development in a sustainable manner, it is an endorsement of the movement rooted in enlightenment and a project of others as they move from place to place to the distasteful needs of others. Should it be sustainable or should it be rejected? Yes, no, definitely we have no, no other. For instance, <coughs> when they realized that the opposition was so strong, they then, the past minister, Mr. Benzizuane, then um, uh, published in the government gazette a, a monitorium for 18 months. Okay, Gwede Mandashe has now just published an intention to put um, a moratorium for two years. And we are certain about that because we're saying that means the government is not listening to us on the ground. We are saying we don't want it. Now if they prolong it, they are prolonging violence, they are, they are prolonging the conflict on the ground. So that which causes conflict is not the problem. may not call it the problem. So it should be rejected in this and we have been doing that for 15 years now. But government is not listening. The other question would be, should we, should we really rely on the government listening? No. My name is Mahoni. Mine is only just a comment. Uh, I think I saw about this case and cut life sometime in 2016. The Matikama local municipality. Yes. How different is this? Have, what have you learned from that case and what is happening right now in Colombia? Because I remember 
In 2016, my, 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 my family, I have members of my family who are industrialized Australians. We are talking about this, mm. how Australians are really wreaking havoc in Africa. Yeah. We talked about this company. Yeah. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, have we learned anything from the, you know, this case study? The Spanish is going to, it's along the west coast. It's yeah. about 300 kilometers away from Cape Town, along the near Fred and uh, more than us. Le learning from that, we, it confirmed what we have been saying. To our surprise, the people were taken from Cleveland to go and work there. And, and it, it, it so happened that they were not happy with the condition because they took the, the minority that is agreeing, that is pushing, that is pro mining in Cleveland. They said because we are delaying the mining in Cleveland, so they must take them in order to keep the following and the support active in so they took them to the mining to the mining in Western Cape. And when they got there, you cannot believe when I tell you today, today that they were not happy in the manner they were treated. They then started protests. They were beaten up at the security guards who are owned by the guy I was showing you the picture who was bringing money in Kulubini. His security guards were there. They have got 50% shareholding there. They, they even gave 14 million rands from that mine to go and Lobola and Kolobin in order to entice people to support mining, it didn't work. Some of them, they were beaten up there. They had to phone us on the anti-mining to help them with bus tickets to come back from there. Mm -hmm. So, and they came back and they, they, and they abandoned the, the being the, the pro because they began to see the reality mm -hmm. of what would happen. That's, that gives us a sort of a scope of things to come if the Colombia the, the mining company because because that company is, is, is raining havoc. Even yeah. even their EIA practitioner that they employed is, uh, is, 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 is being questioned. So there's a whole lot of chaos. They've broken all our laws. They've done everything illegally, but to our surprise the mine is still allowed to operate mm -hmm. there. Um, thank you so much Seth for that. Mm -hmm. Very interesting presentation. Um, you painted a beautiful picture of the injustices around capitalism and the well-being of the people and the role that government plays in all this also. I'm very concerned about the, the, disco the strong disconnect that exists between the government, um, environmental activism, and, and, and how the, the, the community is just, just stuck somewhere in the middle. You know, I'm just thinking about like um, the, the long-term um, frameworks that we're signing, the uh, transition to a low-carbon economy, and how the government is, 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 is playing on the, on the enemy's side. Like, are we fighting a lost battle, or are we really going to transition at some point to a low-carbon economy? It's actually more than a mess. I'm not sure what's the correct term to describe. Because it's not only within the sort of development framework, uh, often when I say development, I use this because I hate the word development. Uh, because it has got terrible connotations because we assume of uh, what it means as you heard from what they also say. So there is a whole lot, you have to look at the laws being passed in parliament for traditional leadership now. You will be surprised. Government is trying by all means to pass the laws in parliament that give authority to traditional leaders, which they do not have in the traditional system. The traditional system is a bottom-up process, but government keeps on, you can look at all the new bills, you can look at Clara, you can look at now the Hoysan and the traditional leadership bill, but they are trying to give traditional leaders authority over people. It doesn't work like that in the traditional system. Traditional system the people, they go to Lehuta, Imbizo, Komkulu, they make a decision about whether they want it or they don't. Then the traditional is supposed to take that as a mandate from the people. That's why in the traditional system, a traditional leader must be the last one to talk, to say, if I had you, my people, you are saying A, B, C, D, then they will say in Zulu, in Gele, too. They are, that's our view, that's what we are saying. If the summer is wrong, they would say, no, 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 no. That's why we say in Africa, a, a traditional leader is a leader through his people. Inkosi, inkosi ngabantu. Mrena, mrena gubatu. Yes. So, so we say that because he cannot be the leader 
without the consensus. They rule through consensus by the people. It's a bottom-up process. All the laws being passed in parliament, they are top-down. In terms of giving the traditional leader authority to make decisions on behalf of the people, it was worse in the Hoysan and the traditional leadership bill. They were even saying a traditional leader, a traditional council, has has got a right to sign agreements with investors. So, and you know that the investors, it's about the government trying to say, we want to mine this area. The Trashakas doesn't have even to consult people. They just go and sign that. Mm -hmm. So we keep every year fighting new bills coming out of parliament that are making traditional leaders like our um, authority supervisors, which is the same. So it's not only in this way. So we are moving towards that trajectory because the government, government will forever, politicians will forever sleep in one blanket with the, with the big business, forever. And they try to create that environment which will enable that. I'm a, I'm a still question. Two comments with two semi-questions. The, the fir first is when you're talking about the international environment and the national environment, you talked about the resources of those levels, whereas those are sort of uh, minority resources in very hostile uh, capitalist uh, classes and companies and environments. So that, so the international environment is firstly one of rapacious capitalism. It's not one of the MDGs. The national level is of a, a capitalist economy with a, a, a government which is trying to manage it, uh, quite a lot of complicity, some concern for social issues, uh, uh, and, and so, so on. And that level of go government is one which we cannot escape. If we have just struggles like mm. the one you have been describing, mm. that those struggles will slowly be marginalized and crushed mm. if there is not a struggle for a state which uh, takes, it, where, when it's doing national accounts, it accounts for the environment mm. so that uh, to destroy one river should be equivalent to a loss of billions of uh, rands, and, and that should be in the national accounts. Uh, so, so there needs to be a struggle for, 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 uh, to get the state to do that. But the, the state has to, do, to run a service econom uh, economy and inc uh, uh, bigger and bigger because you don't want to be based so much on mining. Uh, um, but that service economy is dominated now by finance. Uh, we need renewable energy. Renewable energy is, does not create jobs for the working class. It's providing middle class skilled jobs. So there's struggles at all levels of, of the economy. So when we accept the, the necessity of the the struggle of, of, uh, of what you have been describing. We need to ally that, this with struggles to make a better state and to get a, a, a better shape of the e economy. Uh, without that, your struggle will be crushed. Yes. I, I fully agree. Also, I want to put it out there that the challenge as well we have with the academics is that your, 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 the role that academics is supposed to be playing is appearing to be very limited because academics, they do research, they publish papers and journals, mm -hmm. and they are not writing and bringing to the fore and making sure that the research we do is brought to the fore to inform the mainstream. For instance, the struggling because it's not only Colombian, there are many other people who are fighting to, to, to keep their land. And where is the voice of the academics in order to entrench, to be able to say those struggles, they are justified? Because academics, they do have an important role uh, that they play in terms of informing policy frameworks, uh, policy undertakings, you see, in terms of... So that challenge and making sure that we are able Yes, there are academics who are working, who are consultants for, for the state, in different places and all that, but often people are caught in, uh, in not biting the hand that fits them. Mm -hmm. Tourism. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to say like you know especially ecotourism in the rural areas to say ecotourism itself can be a bigger spinner of mm-hmm. of economic development but mm-hmm. somewhere you know i've come to realize that even the tourism industry you know ecotourism can also be equally exploited because yes. especially with the with the um, trans uh, halahadi trans yeah frontier mm-hmm. park you know where the language the very language of 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 community development through tourism mm-hmm. you know can actually be exploited like you know to interrupt the livelihoods of people and displacing them and so mm-hmm. on Mm-hmm. and to find that you know these tourist industries are actually run by big you know mm-hmm. uh, foreign owned uh, companies and so on mm-hmm. so therefore i'm quite interested about the tourism mm-hmm. industry in Colombia mm-hmm. to say you know how mm-hmm. how 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 deeply immersed or or, or or rooted is it to the people themselves do they feel it is their industry you know mm-hmm. does the money come to them you know in those particular yes. terms yeah well, one thing we say is that with the tourism must be owned. For instance, we have got a floor planning, Giddy Lodge, and we are having that Kwanyana Kemba showed you. Mm. And Kwanyana Kemba will be owned by Mdolana and Bindu and the people, the neighboring villages. So therefore, then we can build up the camp. We can get an investor to rent it. Already the Mtendu Lodge, which I showed you, belongs to the community. And there is an investor there who is r- renting that from the community with a very clear agreement that they sign. Like first they gave him five years to try. Now he is on the next phase now for about another 10 or 15 years. So in terms of ownership, we are very clear. In terms of the proceeds that must come to the community, we have got a tourism committee that sits um, and then to discuss, to plan. We have our own the, 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 the concept plan. We raise funds to build the resort so that we own it. We get an investment, all that, because we don't want a tourism, ecotourism that is designed outside by somebody who doesn't understand. So we are very particular in, in terms of how it is going to benefit, and also in terms of so that it and again it must be done at the level and the scale of the local so that they could be able to. It doesn't help to bring in an exotic. Um, in, in like in the Walkustan, which is which is going to be beyond the reach of the ordinary people. So it has got to be done at the level of the people so that they could be able to own Remember that time when they were feeding the horses here with carrots? Yeah, I remember that.